So what? Your question is, who am I? My name is John DeCamp. I guess you'd describe me as a, a worn-out politician and a sometime lawyer and uh, father of a mess of children, uh, husband of a little Vietnamese boat person refugee named Na, and uh, kind of peripherally at least uh, involved in the so-called patriot movement as a result of some of the cases I've worked on over the years. So let's see, worn out politician. For about 16 years, I was a Nebraska state senator. In fact, if you go back and check the records or even the internet, I guess, you'll, you'll see that I was probably one of the most, if not the most controversial senator uh, for a number of years and one of the most effective, even according to some of my uh, uh, worst enemies, the Omaha World Herald newspaper, for example. And uh, I think I have probably the record for uh, the, one of the most unusual races to get to be a senator. Let's see. My entire campaign was run from a place called Vietnam during a war called the Vietnam War, and I won the election without ever setting foot in the United States. I was a combat infantry captain in Vietnam at the time and uh, working on my assignments over there, some kind of strange things. Came back here, uh, became a state senator, and of course kept my law practice going and a number of other businesses from banks to insurance to land development to agriculture to uh, construction company to you name it and here about 10 years ago I think it is almost 10 years exactly I left the legislature and uh, became pretty active then running a law firm I have half a dozen lawyers here in my my little firm in Nebraska that that work for me under me with me against me whatever and uh, I live in a little town 30 miles south of Lincoln, Nebraska, a little town called Claytonia, Nebraska. And uh, that pretty much sums up my life. I've been a candidate for governor uh, where I managed to snatch a defeat from the jaws of victory at the critical moment when the polls showed me ahead. And I guess I was still trying to figure that one out on some of these electronic voting machines, but that's a story for another day. Um, that's about it. That's me, John DeCamp. You want to know uh, how I got involved in... Okay. Well, let's see. How did I ever become involved in this so-called patriot movement and representing militia and free men and people involved in the Oklahoma bombing and uh, just you name it? It goes back a ways. About 10 years ago. Yeah, it'd be almost 10 years ago. Um, after I was out of the legislature, I was attorney for... A senator called Senator Lauren Schmidt and uh, some events occurred here in Nebraska that had nationwide repercussions. A black man by the name of Larry King officially identified as the fastest rising star in the or black star in the Republican Party at the time. In fact some of you folk if you remember if you went to the or watched on television the Republican National Convention 1984 and then the Republican National Convention 1988 Larry King was the big, big uh, man, big black man you saw opening both of those national conventions, Republican national conventions, by singing the, the national anthem, the Star Spangled Banner. Well, on election day, 1988, Larry King, who in his private life uh, supposedly had a small minority credit union over in North Omaha, which he was supposedly helping the community with loans, Larry King's little credit union was raided by federal officials they discovered that there was uh, apparently a problem there. One of the problems was this little $2 million credit union had a secret set of books that showed another $40 million had come in from a variety of sources from Boys Town to Union Pacific Railroad to ConAgra, some of the biggest corporations in America that had funneled into there and had disappeared. And Larry, it seems, uh, didn't have any good explanations and didn't uh, acknowledge that he had even gotten this money. Well, as things... <clears throat> developed on this little credit union called the Franklin Credit Union that Larry ran. As things uh, evolved, the legislature thought it should do an investigation into whether something went wrong with the laws or whether laws needed to be changed or this or that. And as uh, their investigation got going, and I was the attorney for one of the senators, the chairman of that committee, Senator Schmidt, as things got going, strange, strange stories started floating out from from children on the streets to other places, uh, particularly some of these young kids that, that yeah, they knew Larry King, and, uh, yeah, he was a big man on campus. Uh, they had ridden with him in his private jets and 
to his mansion in Washington, D.C., where they had participated in sex orgies and with some of the most famous politicians and business men whose names you'd immediately recognize. Well, more and more of these stories started coming out and more strange things about Larry's credit union. As I say, uh, Larry, of course, denied this, but the stories kept getting stronger, and I was one of the first ones, I'll be honest, I was one of the first ones to say, you know, this is nonsense. Uh, these tales are so unbelievable that, that some of these people are coming forward with that uh, that they, they, they should be rejected out of hand. They just aren't, aren't, aren't credible. And then I said something else. I said, and, and if I really believed, if I really believed any of this, uh, I'd be the first one to stand up and say, hey, let's, let's do some prosecuting. Let's lock some people up. Let's correct the situation. Let's, let's get the story out. And uh, well, as things shaped up, make a long story short, I became convinced after a while that there really was uh, a lot of truth to these stories. And I ended up representing some of these children involved. And uh, just an ever-escalating thing on a national level, the story became basically a story of of a very, very horrible and very large uh, uh, ring of people that, that used uh, children for drug couriers, uh, some of the most prominent names and businessmen in this country, uh, that it was being covered up and protected because some of the people involved involved high law enforcement, uh, uh, FBI people uh, wouldn't do their part because uh, some of them were involved. Uh, just, just one horrible thing after another. and. And when, when the dust had finally settled, I went and sat down with, uh, with my very, very good friend, uh, mentor, advisor, uh, guide, a man named Bill Colby, who you folk may remember. Bill Colby used to be the head of the Central Intelligence Agency, and, and he was the man I worked directly for in Vietnam. Officially, he was ambassador over there at the time, but in fact, he really was head of the CIA then, at least in Vietnam, for the Vietnam operations during the war. But anyway, uh, I sat down with Bill, and make a long story short, Bill basically told me to get away from all this, that, that it was so much bigger and so much more deadly and dangerous and where it led and what it involved than anything I ever imagined. And uh, that if I stuck around uh, trying to do something about it, I'd get myself and my family probably uh, killed or, or, or worse. And I said, well, what can I do? I can't just walk away. He said, I'll tell you what, the only way really on these kind of things because of where it goes and what it involves. The only way you can probably both protect yourself and try to do something about it may not be in the manner you want, but it's the manner it's going to have to be done eventually. You're going to have to get the national press involved in exposing these things, get it so, so reported and, and so looked into that it can't be covered up because the forces you're against are just too big and too powerful for you to do them in the time you want or the way you want and you keep it up, you're going to end up dead. So I went home, wrote the book, The Franklin Cover-Up, which pretty well details the story from A to Z, and uh, that was my beginning of involvement in, in, let's say, criticizing some elements of government and asking for some reform and trying to point out through very clear documentation some of these problems and why, why how dangerous it is if we get institutions of government corrupted. As a result of that book, and this has taken a long time to get to a simple answer to a simple question. As a result of that book, uh, received some calls and, and some attention from some groups around the country that read the book. I did not spend a penny, by the way, advertising the book, but, but it sold over 50,000 copies. As a result of that book, uh, I got contacted, for example, by some group called the, the Militia of Montana here a few years ago. And uh, when I heard what was going on with them, uh, I agreed to look into it. I thought, oh, a bunch of nuts here that rabble rousing, but. John? Yeah? Arizona Line 4, she's looking for her sister Shannon. Oh, Militia of Montana. So I agreed to look into it. I, I checked on it and I found that there were seven of these individuals up in Montana were arrested and charged with something called criminal syndicalism. And uh, the more I checked, the more I found out that, that there was absolutely no basis for their arrest what they were being arrested for was who they associated with and the beliefs they held or expressed. Not any violence, not any threats of violence or anything else, but simply their speech, free speech. 
and I got into a big battle with the Attorney General and the officials in Montana, but when all the dust had settled, we won the case and got every one of the, the charges dismissed of this nonsensical criminal syndicalism laws against these individuals. And that got me a bit of a reputation in the entire, uh, I guess you'd call it the uh, patriot community at that time, which, which uh, was beginning uh, fairly rapidly this a few years ago to develop a pretty good network of communication via the, the fax and via the shortwave radio and so on. The next major event that occurred that kind of impacted everything was immediately, immediately after the uh, victory in the militia of Montana case and the Freemen, I guess they had some group called the Freemen who, who were also involved in that group that I represented. The next event was something called the Oklahoma City bombing, almost immediately after I won dismissal. And uh, as a result of that, uh, I was asked to represent some of the individuals that were injured, and eventually I ended up representing the grand juror Hoppy Heidelberg. Hoppy Heidelberg was the grand juror who uh, indicted and voted to indict McVeigh and Nichols, but who also stepped forward and said, wait a minute, you know, it, 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 we got to indict McVeigh and Nichols, but, but that's only half the story. Uh, uh, my duty as a grand juror, Hoppy's position was, my duty as a grand juror is to find out the whole truth of what happened, and, and I'm, I'm being prevented from doing that, uh, and, and in fact, I'm being threatened. Of course, they eventually the judge removed Hoppy from the grand jury, and uh, I represented him, <clears throat> making sure that they didn't attempt anything else. So that case and a number of others ha have led me, so to speak, to represent some of these groups and become pretty deeply involved, at least, in uh, trying to learn uh, just how big and large and wide and fat and noisy and whatever the entire animal is. Subsequent to that, I took all the militia leaders from across the United States before the United States Senate for the famous hearings, and we had one demand. We all agreed in advance we would have one demand in return for them fulfilling that demand, in return for the Senate. Senator Specter was the one that reached the agreement with us. We would bring, I would bring all militia leaders they wanted from across the United States, Michigan, Montana, you name it. We would answer any and every question that they could put to us. And remember, this is shortly after Oklahoma when they're saying the militia did this and militia this, and, and they had the whole world making it believe that uh, uh, the militia were, were, were ready to blow up the universe or something, when uh, the truth was, uh, as I explained, and as I'll repeat again, the truth was one gang on a Saturday night in Los Angeles does more damage than all the militias across the country have from the beginning of uh, the militia movement. But anyway, we made our one demand in return for answering everything, doing anything they wanted, agreeing even to take lie detector tests on any answer that, that, that any of these militia leaders gave. What was our demand? Our demand was that the Senate reopen hearings into Waco and Ruby Ridge. That was our agreement. We'll come forward and testify, give you any answers. I'll represent them and bring them here. You, the Senate, agree to hold hearings on Waco and Ruby Ridge and look into those things because we don't think the America, the American people are getting the total truth. Well, I don't need to go into that much more. The rest is history. The hearings did occur. Uh, a lot of bad things were found out, and uh, they go on today. So that's kind of how I got involved in this whole thing of representing some of these groups and maybe seeing both sides and, and, uh, and uh, kind of acting as an intermediary, if you would, between... Uh, uh, the judicial system on occasion in the Patriot Movement, between the government on occasion in the Patriot Movement, uh, trying to force some integrity and justice into some of the systems. I've got some cases still in, in Montana and some of the other places where they're using abusive laws to try to lock people up and are locking them up for what they say, what they believe, and what they think, the very, the very opposite of what the First Amendment's all about. Anyway, as, as I understand your question, you're wondering, well, uh, as a result of this whole Franklin thing I got involved in, uh, was it anything more than just a, I raised the question myself, anything more than a bunch of uh, homosexuals locally uh, uh, playing with each other and trying to cover up some of their sins and being involved with some kids? And the answer is absolutely yes. In fact, that's how, as I say, uh, I ended up writing the book because it went so far beyond anything here. It involved a, a true Who's there? It involved a true, 
national network of, of uh, very bad behavior by some of the most powerful politicians and businessmen in this country. And I name in the book, and I document very clearly from A to Z. And the second book I wrote that just came out here about four or five years after that first book takes the story from the original book and, and finishes it up. What's happened to these people? What's happened to the girl, for example, Alicia Owen, that dared to stand up and tell what had happened to her as a young, as a young child? What's happened to some of the boys uh, that testified? For example, a young man named Paul Benassi, who identified all kinds of horrible uh, things from his, his earliest age on. He, he, he got involved in uh, from uh, uh, some of this mind control stuff that the government was experimenting with at the time, which people don't want to believe existed, just like we don't want to believe a lot of things that the government unfortunately has done and then had to fess up to later. But, but uh, something called the Monarch Project, which wasn't even the real name. Uh, that was the name the kids came to know by a government program that, that played around with their minds and was going to use kids as anti-terrorist devices and would-be saboteurs to uh, penetrate other countries and this type of thing. But, but the story itself, as I say, went so far beyond, quote, Nebraska or Omaha. For example, Larry King, the black man I've identified in the book and, and who's now in prison on other things, by the way, he, uh, he maintained a $5,000 a month mansion on Embassy Row in Washington where he brought the children and uh, flew them in and like the kids were saying and they're his private Lear jets and would have these incredible parties and there's nothing more effective or more powerful to control a politician or a prominent businessman than to have them provided uh, uh, sexual trist or some drugs or a combination thereof particularly with some underage child or or young girl or boy or or uh, manifest uh, homosexual proclivities uh, that are recorded secretly on film that are then used to compromise this or that politician or businessman. And uh, that's where the Franklin, Franklin cover-up story started. And as I say, it's led me into all these, these other things. And there's always the tendency or concern on my part or, or anybody's part, well, are, are you one of those uh, nut network people that, that start talking this conspiracy theory and that conspiracy theory and that one? I have tried to be extremely cautious on that. And so anything I say in the book anything and everything I have a document for. For example, when the first book came out, the first reaction, the absolute first reaction of a number of people that were named in the book and their lawyers was to issue public statements saying I was going to be sued uh, in the biggest libel and defamation suits ever and I would be broke and disbarred and everything else and there have been more than a few attempts to, to hurt and punish me. However, there's only been one lawsuit out of that book. That was when I sued a what was it, uh, Atlantic Telecast Company over in Wilmington, North Carolina, an East Coast uh, television company, for them daring to go on television and saying that, that the book was not true. And uh, I found out later that uh, the police chief from Omaha, who's clearly identified by me in the book, a man named Wadman, is involved in all this with the Alicia Owen girl and so on. Uh, uh, I found out he had gone to the Wilmington people and said, oh, this is all, all. so I sued them. I sued them and and at first they, of course, said, no, 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 we aren't going to do anything. Uh, you're wrong, we're right. Well, within three weeks, they had done some of their own investigation, and they backed down and paid me a financial settlement, as well as had then a public apology, three nights running as the lead story on their news, apology to the senator from Nebraska, and acknowledged uh, the book was accurate. So uh, the, the Franklin cover-up itself goes way way, way beyond, quote, Omaha, Nebraska. It does describe this national network. It does identify a lot of the politicians. Some frightening things you don't want to hear from. From Iran Contra, that book was, by the way, the first place, the first place to identify the Iran Contra connection, the George Bush uh, uh, potential involvement in some of these things, at least uh, uh, if not his involvement, his tacit approval in some of his key positions from a former head of the CIA. By the way, he's the one that replaced my friend Bill Colby, when Colby was fired, George Bush replaced him and, and became the head of the CIA. But anyway, from uh, Bush to you name it in the White House uh, or, or Congress, uh, the book spills it all out and spells it out and documents it. And then the second book, of course, deals with some of the other things I've mentioned, from the Oklahoma bombing, where I represent the folk there, to uh, these militia cases. And, and I guess if there be an essence or a general theme throughout it is 
we all as Americans want to love our government. We want to believe in our government. We want to we want those things we grew up with knowing were true to actually be true and we're finding contradictory evidence one after another where instead of quote government being the the servant of the people it's become the master and where instead of uh, our revered institutions of government being pure as the driven snow uh, we find that the snow has been pretty heavily laden with some black soot and uh, you wonder what can be done about it and how you're going to go about doing something about it and just how deep it goes and and is it just an isolated instance or is it or is it endemic to the system has corruption in government become endemic to the system to the point where you got real problems and you got to remember people love to babble and chatter about oh democracy and this and american system that and so on and so forth but you got to remember one thing our system of government our system of government doesn't guarantee freedom necessarily. Our system of government doesn't guarantee that you're going to be rich or poor. You know, the only thing that, that really is unique about our system as compared with all other systems that have ever been invented in history, the only really single characteristic that's different than all the rest is it's the only self-correcting system ever invented, ever created, the only self-correcting. When the pendulum swings too far one way, without the bullet, without the bombs, without the revolution, it, quote, self-corrects and starts swinging back the other way. And that's the beauty of our system, that it is self-correcting. And it's worked a dozen times over the 225 years or so of our history. Well, I think we're at one of those critical times now where uh, the correction has to occur and unfortunately the correction may be inhibited quite a bit because the thing that it's supposed to correct that the system is supposed to correct the government itself has become so all-powerful so all-controlling and unfortunately in some cases so abusive and repressive of some of the very things that need to occur to correct which is First Amendment rights this type of thing and so when you have people speak out whether they be free men or or militias or people here on the far right or far left when they speak out and criticize the government they're immediately in any of the media these days the first thing you see is anti-government anti-government uh, and and the labels they'll have these individuals who who might just be saying they think uh, uh, president clinton is wrong or corrupt on something or, or done something wrong they'll immediately have a a litany of anti-government uh, blah 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 tax protest uh, However, however, if it's a Republican, let's say Newt Gingrich saying the identical things, they don't say he's anti-government. They don't say he's this, he's that. All they say is uh, Republican uh, House leader, whatever. My point is they've, they've, they, they've uh, tried to kind of suppress the very things that make the system self-correct, and it really concerns me because we do know the self-correction needs to occur but uh, we're seeing too much now uh, the handicapping or the suppressing of the key tools or elements that, that have made it self-correct in the past. You have to understand the character of, uh, of a Bill Colby. Now, Bill Colby was raised as a Catholic, super strict. Uh, his entire life was, was rigidly following rules. Uh, he was truly this country's greatest spy master, but he also had some pretty strict rules. He saw the war he had conducted, the Cold War, as just as significant as World War II or World War I, maybe even more significant, because the things were beneath the surface most of the time as to what was occurring. It was a war conducted by the CIA and the intelligence community, and during that process, a lot of things developed and were allowed to develop necessarily, at least they thought they were necessary, that are kind of incompatible or don't work good with a free and open society. You know, covert operations and doing this. And Bill was smart enough to realize, Bill was smart enough to realize that that itself was a very danger, creating this system where you had almost a secret government, which he acknowledged had, had effectively occurred, I think, I think would be a fair statement. And therefore, I think he felt a certain duty to be one of those who, since he was so intimately involved in that creation, 
also the correcting of it and, and making sure there were, quote, constitutional safeguards and, and political safeguards and, and popular safeguards against the existence and creation and control by a secret system or set of governments there. And uh, one of the things, the primary thing Bill was doing the last years of his life, in fact, I was with him literally two weeks before his, his alleged uh, falling out of a canoe and dying. I was with him two weeks, and we, we had a very good chat. It was like, like it, was, it was just after his 75th birthday, and he was in the best health. He had completed a physical and was in the best health ever. And I asked him, I said, Bill, what, what would you say would be the happiest five years of your life if you were going to pick a period in history, five years, maybe back during World War II when you were leading the secret attempts to, to uh, get into Germany and, or, or ahead of the CIA or what? He said, I'll tell you what, John. He said, the last five years and the next five years. And I said, wait a minute, why? Because, because I'm really doing what I enjoy now, and even more than that, what I think can really make a difference in the world. And remember, this is the man that was over there with Yeltsin when they were having the collapse of the Russian Empire and the, the coup or push or pooch or whatever you call them. Uh, he, he was with Yeltsin, believe it or not, right when this was occurring, you know. Uh, in Russia here a few years ago. Well, anyway, Bill's, what he was doing now was traveling all over the world, meeting with world leaders and, and top business leaders from around the world and giving his analysis of where we were in the world and where they were and, and how the pieces were fitting together. He was the best individual there was when it came to looking out and seeing the road of the future, what's happening, how the pieces are going to fit into place. And that's what he enjoyed, traveling all over the world, meeting with these people, giving them uh, some direction and input based on a lifetime of uh, knowing what's going on both behind the scenes and under the covers and on top of the covers and how the two sometimes fit and how they don't fit. So he was, he was in absolutely uh, the best shape he'd ever been, uh, the best mood he'd ever been, and uh, that's what he was planning to do and, and, and had been doing. And so he said the last five years and the next five years. So here I, I'm listening to the radio and television a couple weeks later, and supposedly uh, he's violated every single rule that he followed all his life. In other words, walking out at night, canoeing, which he didn't particularly enjoy, uh, leaving his uh, food on the table, television and computers on. Uh, come on. The man, the man never had a hair out of place if, uh, if anybody uh, followed his character. I mean, he, so when they tell me that he, he goes out under these conditions, falls out of his canoe, then drowns and can't be found for 10 days, and then 10 days or whatever it is later, they find him in exactly the spot they've searched a thousand times, but he, he wasn't found there. I say, uh-huh, right. And then I say exactly what Bill always used to say, if it's done right, you'll never know who did it or why. And in this case, I, in my own mind, absolutely do not believe the man went out, fell out of his canoe, <laughs> and, and drowned. Uh, and I believe that for whatever reason, uh, he was a thorn in somebody's side, and uh, he had to be shut up, and that's what occurred. Well, I, you, the question has been raised as to uh, whether there was any incentive or, or, or desire on the part of our U.S. Justice Department, in other words, recently and currently headed by Janet Reno, uh, to look into matters of the Franklin thing. Colby himself, and I have the letter, Colby himself personally went to Janet Reno, gave her some background on, on the subject, personally asked and was promised that the Justice Department would uh, look into it, investigate, and, and, and work and cooperate with me on that. Uh, Back. Bill got a letter back from them assuring him of that. To the best of my knowledge, not one thing was ever done. Now, why that was, I don't know. Uh, I'm sure there uh, could be a dozen explanations, but I do know they, uh, at the highest levels, Janet Rito herself, uh, Colby went and asked personally, based on his background, that something be done and uh, was promised in writing it would be, and to the best of my knowledge, it never has been. Now, um, which raises the question of the Justice Department itself. Is it functioning like it should? And I guess that's one of the key elements in, in my new book. And by the way, my new book, The Franklin Cover-Up, is the revised edition, which is 
with the entire first book, an entirely new book dealing with Oklahoma and the freemen and the militias, the patriot movement, the follow-up to the original Franklin thing, uh, a lot of these things. But, but in the new book, I try to select half a dozen, for example, key cases of very national prominence handled by our Justice Department, wherein it is clear, it is clear, not by my stating it, not by my even saying, uh, I think this, but by the judgments of the system itself, the courts themselves involved, that our Justice Department has done the precise opposite of what it was created to do. Instead of, uh, instead of uh, protecting and following the rule of law, they have, in fact, become the users and abusers of the rule of law. And I, as I say, I, I list a variety of cases from the far right to the far left, where you would have to say, in all honesty, whether you agree or disagree with the individuals involved. For example, the LaRouche case I cite, because it is so well documented that here was a guy that was a thorn in the butts of a lot of high government officials to the point where he was beginning to be able to impact the political system, which is what it's all about. That's how the pendulum starts swinging back when, when somebody on the noisy right or the noisy left or whatever starts raising issues and it makes people think and look and they start slowly swinging. Their solution to this man was simply to lock him up, set him up. Okay, then you pick the case of uh, oh, uh, the Demandjo De case, I think it was, where the courts, the court system at the highest levels finally said this is a fraud perpetrated on the American people you know, just because uh, they wanted to accommodate the Israeli lobby, you know. And uh, I, I cite case after case where our Justice Department has been the abuser uh, uh, of the rule of law rather than the enforcer of it. And uh, whenever a system where its key piece, the justice, your justice system, is the thing that makes all the rest of the clock tick and the parts go in synchronous, when your key driving force gets corrupted, you've got problems. And that's what I think I, I see occurring too often now in this country. And so when we take the Franklin case, which really covers the entire spectrum of all these cases on a grand level, and where it leads, and you get a promise and a commitment from the Justice Department to look into it, and they do the precise opposite, I think it is one more reflection of, of how serious it's become. And again, because you're, quote, see a, a, a rotten spot in your government and you say, well, let's correct it. That doesn't mean you're anti-government. It doesn't mean you're, you're uh, evil or a radical or a crazy or a nut or far right or far left. What it means is you love your system. You love, you know, a clean government and you want to make sure it doesn't get any more contaminated. But the way it's shaped up and evolving now, anybody that dares speak out is either suppressed, labeled as a nut, or anti-government, and uh, the thing that they're trying to expose or correct is in fact uh, sanctified, ratified, and approved, and uh, leads on to even more grievous problems for the future, and that's what's occurring too frequently now. If the argument is always given, um, if you can just disarm the people, and of course there's a thousand historical comparisons, and and uh, scenarios, and, and the one they like to present or paint the most is uh, the famous one in Germany. Uh, one of the first things was disarm the populace. Therefore, if you need to shut them up or shut somebody down, you don't have that, that, that serious problem with somebody being able to resist, at least forcefully, with any arms. So it's, it, it's a boiling problem. I can, I can sure see the opposite side of the equation, too, the typical the typical American in the 1990s and the year 2000, uh, their only contact with a gun uh, is what they see on television and people shooting, and uh, we have an urban population as opposed to an agrarian population. Their only contact with anybody with guns is, is when they see the Saturday night news and, and uh, the gang shooting each other up or somebody robbing a bank or whatever. And it's real difficult to reconcile uh, your Second Amendment rights, and remember it is a right, 
your, your Second Amendment rights with uh, the problems we're facing. And uh, most of the people seeing the, the so-called gun grabbers, as they would view the uh, government, most of the people on the other side of that equation, uh, the ones that hold guns, whether for defense or, or recreation or hunting or sporting activities, most of those people, when they see the government or legislation, uh, they believe, I think most of them believe very sincerely, that there's a, quote, hidden agenda of government. If you can just disarm the population or control the gun supply close enough so that you know who's got a gun, where they have, everything about them, uh, then any time you want to implement something as a government, you don't have to worry about that faction being able to resist it. I guess my personal, personal opinion is the real battle over this issue has not come yet by a long way. I do believe there is a segment of the government, I'm, I'm completely satisfied there's a segment of the government that wants to disarm the population for the reasons that I don't think are warranted. That is to make sure nobody can resist government. I think there's another very, very sincere and honest segment of government that, that is trying to grapple with this problem of the Saturday night specials and the guns and the murders and the criminals and, and they simply don't know how to best do it. Um, it's uh, a battle that hasn't yet occurred. It's only beginning to take shape and it's going to get a lot more acute and severe. I would point out, I would point out, as I have in political speeches, that if you take all the murders and killings and everything else that are going on and have gone on with guns, you're going to be hard pressed. You're going to be awfully hard pressed to find, as I pointed out to Ted Koppel on his nightline one time, I said, in fact, I'll sit here and you tell me, Ted. I said, give me a list. Give me a list of all, all, terrorist acts and murders committed by all the militia people you can identify in the last 10 or 15 years. And I said, and I'll guarantee you one thing. All of them totaled up. All of them totaled up. Won't amount to as many killings as occur in Los Angeles on a typical Saturday night from just the gang wars. And I guess that, that really is my point in this whole thing, this, this dichotomy and difficulty of resolving the, the right to bear arms issues. The people wanting to bear arms aren't the ones wanting them for improper purposes, yet they're the ones that they're trying to take all, all the arms away from. The ones that really are the problem, somehow uh, the efforts aren't directed at them or don't seem to be very effective. So I don't know where this battle is headed, but it's not over. But it's merely a symptom. That's what we, we don't see. It's merely a symptom of the overall problem of, of uh, what has reached almost a warlike condition between a, at least a certain segment of the population and the government in their attitude and philosophy. We know. We know now, not from me saying it or you or anybody else, we know from CNN, USA Today, the Republican Party official polls, the Democratic Party official polls, we know officially. That 76% of the American people, the John Doe's and the Mary Rose, we know that 76%, that's more than three out of every four Americans, no longer, quote, trust or believe that their government is telling the truth to them when the government gives them their official story or report or the official government version on something, whether it be plane crashes or, or, uh, wartime events or one thing or another, three out of four Americans no longer believe their own government when they, when they get their official report. Now, that's dangerous for this reason. And by the way, officially that's the highest percentage since they've ever been keeping these polls, the highest percentage in American history of Americans who no longer believe or trust their government as to, as to the government being straight with them. It's dangerous because the very essence of our system, this wonderful self-correcting system when it's allowed to function, the very essence of it is confidence, support, trust of the people in it, in the system.
And that's where we've got a, a frightening problem coming. And, and the politicians, unfortunately, are really so distant from the populace these days, so distant that they don't even see this. They don't realize the implications. And, and uh, they don't view themselves as, quote, servants of the people. They view, view them as masters. I, I use just little examples of how the system has just evolved and changed so dramatically in the last 25 or 30 years. It used to be, yeah, did your business and, and whatever, and then you ran for office, and you had some background experience. You check. Yeah, I dare you. Go to any state. Go to the federal Congress. Find out how many people have never done anything except from the moment they got out of school or whatever. Government staffer, then their government job here. They're just moving up with the goal to be, quote, in that Congress or whatever politician. It's never been anything other than the intent to be 100% a government, uh, government employee. And you know, there was another system that had virtually a similar system. We don't like to admit this. It was called the nomenclatura. You ever hear that phrase, nomenclatura? The nomenclatura was simply the bureaucracy that ran Russia, the Soviet Union. And they, they had it so tight and such great benefits and so much convinced that, that they were special that they just could never see the force for the trees when she finally all sank. We didn't. What, they, what, what beat them? Was it a bomb? Was it troops marching in? They just sank of their own weight. They self-destructed in. That's what could happen here, self-destruction by, by a lack of confidence of the people, by too tight-knit a bureaucracy that absolutely believes it's, it, it is a Brahmin caste, you know, of, of, uh, of uh, people that are entitled to their own special schools and special this and special rights and special pensions and special high salaries. It used to be. I can remember when I first got into politics, crazy as this sounds, it used to be that if you were in government, you kept looking for that opening to get that better job on the outside. I'll guarantee you, you go to any state. The game now is to figure out how to get from the outside to that inside of government. No longer are you fighting to get out into better jobs on the outside. Now you try to get in because that's where the good jobs are, the good pensions, all the guaranteed this and that. It's just a completely different system. Uh, from what it functioned as for the first couple hundred years of our history, and it's a dangerous system unless we get it self-correcting. And it can't self-correct right now very well because anybody that raises the flag and says, this is wrong, or I want to say this, they lock them up if they happen to be in Montana, or they drag them uh, from another state if they speak out in a newspaper. They've demonstrated they have the ability to do this as government. And I represent a lot of these people on pure First Amendment cases. I may, I may think they're nuts. I may think they're crazier than a kook. I may think those freemen are living in la-la land. But they do have the right to speak out, raise hell, criticize. And when you suppress that and lock them up for that, you've destroyed effectively the one tool that makes, as I say, the heart, the engine, that makes our system work that, that self-correcting te technique, you've destroyed it because no longer do the other eyes get it, ideas get to come in and compete and match and people say, well, I, 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 he may be right. You, you're just fed pablum. And that's what our national media has become too often now. Just the pablum feeders. You don't get, you don't get the balanced picture. You don't get the other side. And those that dare to try to give the other side so frequently now are viewed simply as nuts or tabloid type or whatever. You're, 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 you're almost, it's almost as if you, you have this circle where unless you go along with a certain line, you know, you're not going to get your story on the press. You're not going to get your story told. You're not going to get uh, uh, the balanced treatment. You've got to be inside the circle, so to speak of thought, idea, whatever. And that's scarier than Blaze's, too. Because, the, as I say, the, the, the fundamental mechanism for change is instead of battling with fists and bullets and cannons, we battle with our mouths, our ideas, our competing philosophies, our uh, conflicting concepts. And it's, it's now, not only are we wanting to... Uh, not allow any open conflict uh, of any kind, but we want to uh, 
eliminate the ability to have conflicting concepts, conflicting philosophies, conflicting ideas, uh, things that would criticize or, or condemn or disagree with, with the Justice Department or with this party or, or that. It, it's a dangerous situation and uh, uh, you know we, we watched the nomenclatura sink of its own weight over in the, there in Russia. It could happen here. I got a funny feeling that if it happens here you might see a lot of the same pain that they're going through over there, which is uh, trying to recreate a system, and uh, some of the people on the top end up being on the bottom, and pretty chaotic. <laughs> well, I, I concluded my, my latest book after, uh, after a particularly depressing, distressing occurrence in a court on a matter involved in the Franklin thing, where one of the witnesses, one of the key witnesses, a young man who had been involved in this all of his life, wanted to tell the truth, but was told, if you talk, you know, you're going to prison for 20 years, just like we did to Alicia Owen. And they sent to Alicia Owen now. She's in prison, been there for a long time. And they told the boy, if you, you go ahead, you, you dare to speak out against the county attorney or whatever. You're going to prison. We'll charge you with perjury, and you've seen we can do it. So afterwards, and he took the Fifth Amendment and just hung his head and said, if, they, if I say anything, they'll, they'll lock me up for 20 years. So anyway, afterwards, I went to the judge. I said, Judge, you know, I, I am so depressed. I love our system so much. I, I just, the judge says, well, he just kept saying over and over, I'm, I'm just a, a man. I'm not a god. I'm just a man. I'm not a god. I'm just a man. I'm not a god. I can only, I can only do with, with, with the things I'm given, the evidence. And, and he's right, I suppose. And I said, I, I, I said, everybody knows the truth. Everybody knows. Every, every official, every judge, including you. And he said, yeah. And then he said something else. He said, I can't change it, but I can help you understand it. I said, what? He says, if you want to understand Franklin, if you want to understand the Franklin cover-up, if you want to understand what really happened, go read Billy Budd. I said, what? He said, if you want to understand, you won't agree, you won't like it, but at least you'll be able to understand it. He said, go read Billy Budd. I said, who the blazes is Billy Budd? He said, just go read it. You'll understand. Well, I walked out of there. I was mad. That was the last I ever heard or thought of Billy Budd for months. And then I was sitting one night on a Saturday night, might have even had a Jack Daniels or two, and watching TV, going through the channels, and all at once I hit a movie, and I see my screen has one of those things where it prints it out, you know, and you can read whatever it is, and it has Billy Budd, and I whoop, halted my TV and started looking. And it was a great movie. And when it was finished, I understood why this little girl, Alicia Owen, had to go to prison, why uh, uh, 20 people that I identified in the book from, from kids, uh, children, had to be killed. Uh, why uh, things are going on in Washington. I understood why the cover-up had to be. It all made sense. I didn't like it, just like the judge said, but I understood it. Billy Budd was written by a guy named Herman Melville, same guy that wrote Moby Dick. And Billy Budd is a simple story. Uh, it's during the uh, great days of the English or British Navy when they were riding high and mighty and having squabbles with different countries and... and uh, Billy Budd is a young, beautiful, uh, 18 or 19 year old boy that's been impressed, you know, forced into the, the service. And, and despite that, he's, he's a good sailor. And uh, on this ship of all these tough guys, this uh, British uh, military ship, Billy gets uh, into a squabble with, with uh, a guy who was absolutely the most vile creature on earth at the time he had to be, who was the, the second in command of the ship or whatever. And through a kind of an accident or incident, he tries to do something to Billy and something happens and Billy swings and that guy falls